I have absolutely no idea what went wrong here. I had the link for the live stream up for two days on my YouTube channel. And Sean and I were in the room together chatting about what we're going to talk about tonight and just kind of getting prepped. And wouldn't you know it, five minutes, maybe six minutes, something like that, before we're supposed to start, all of a sudden, my live stream vanished. We were in a dead room. What so, does that mean? <laughs> yeah. So I have I had to stop and kick Sean out, and I had to go ahead and make a new live stream link and put my thumbnail on there and and make it go. Ooh. So it was really bizarre. But okay. at any rate, we're up and running. It's amazing how often the devil gets into the details and tries to mess up these live streams. But for those of you who don't know Sean, Sean, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello. Um, you might have seen me before on Prophecy Watchers and uh, some other places, but uh, the main reason I've come here today is because, for one, I love your channel. I love the stuff that you do. I love your videos. Um, they're so packed with information and I've come to the conclusion you don't eat or sleep with the amount of stuff you put out. <laughs> um, I wanted to come on here because I, I'm right there with you. We are, we are running out of time and I am of the kind of person when Jesus says, I could wish that you were either cold or hot because if you were one or the other, I could use you. And for a good part of my life when I was younger, I was cold and um, very cold. And I ran from God. I was angry from God. I know what it's like to be in their shoes. And at the time, I did go to um, prove God wrong if I could and throw it in my family's face. But um, instead, I proved it and, you know, all of it right to myself. So then I had a new problem. And. Long story short, he has very much so changed me. He's changed my trajectory. He's changed my heart. He's shown me that his values are correct. Like, he tells us not to do these things because they protect us. He says these are bad things because if you do them, things get worse. That's right. And you can put these to the test. It's like, I can't deny that. That's what, it doesn't pan out well if I do this. It pans out better if I do that. Um, it doesn't mean that life's going to not be a trial. But anyways, um, there's so many things that I, I want to say to Christians like, you know, we're not called to be absolutely brilliant scholars. We're called to be witnesses. And yeah. I want people to take God out of the church. I want them to bring God out into the places where people don't believe. I don't want them to just be on Facebook groups where it's nothing but Christians and maybe some non-Christian will go wandering in there, but you know, and that's good and it's a good place to practice, but go start finding out what works because I did that. And the cycle I went on was first get more education, find out why the Bible's real, find out why you believe in it so that you can always have an answer, then deliver it with gentleness and respect. But what I found above all, even after what I've learned, is um, if you lead with love, it is so much more effective if you let them know how much you care about them first. If you don't, like even if it's a Christian with another Christian, if you're going to start talking about rapture timing or something, just figure out what works. And for that one, by the way, salvation. Get salvation really well understood and you start winning those battles not that that's what we're after either, but like we're after the truth, we're after love, we're after uh, being effective. So my whole life journey has been trying to do that, trying to work on myself, trying to see what works and practicing. The internet is a terrible place, but it's a wonderful place to, as well, just like all things, you know, they could either be used for good or evil, and you can practice on the internet. Go to Facebook and go start seeing what you, and it's a lot of self-control too, because I became a mechanic and I found most people, even mechanics who are trained, who study, who learn the material, the biggest problem that they had 
was battling themselves and being honest with what's in front of them. So I find myself, I'll go like talk to someone on Facebook and I don't get really upset. I'll walk away because <laughs> you're not supposed to, if you still got to work through that, if you still got to be gentle and respectful and loving, then this is a good training ground. This is a good place to figure that out. And not all of us are Ray Comforts who are going to go out there to the street and do some very, I, my skin crawls when I watch those videos because I'm like, you know, he's an older guy. He's talking to young people. I'm not sure if they would respect me like they respect him. All these doubts go through your head, but we're not all built the same. So let's find out what works for us and try to develop it. Hey, Amen. So how long ago did you get converted and how did that come about? Um, I can remember being somewhere around 13 wondering how I was saved. I can, I can remember even going up on my roof and thinking about that, like looking up at the sky going, I don't feel any different. I believe in Jesus. I don't feel any different. That was then. Then my whole family got blown apart. A nasty divorce. My brothers went off to college. I was basically alone and left when I was 18. But um, after... After that, I, I, I was doing whatever I wanted. I went to California. I started being an idiot there. Plenty of things to do wrong in California. And um, you start to see the fruits of that. You're like, is this all there is? Like, I wanted this. I went and got it. I went to parties. I had the time that I thought that I was the best thing that you could achieve. And I'm like, one of the things about letting someone go like that is they're going to go see what it's worth is. And it took that for me. And I went and did that and I came back and I'm like, this has only so much value. This is going to run out. I'm going to get old. I'm not going to have a family. I'm not going to have nothing. And um, it was being honest and knowing. And even when I was like, like Solomon writes about, he's like, I was doing all this stuff. I denied myself no pleasures and uh, all along wisdom was still there, correcting me, rebuking me. And uh, that, that was very much so what happened. So when I, when I got married, um, I was a pretty lukewarm Christian, pretty, I was still returning. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until I started like all these people that I cared about who don't believe, don't want to look, I was like, you you don't know what you're missing. There's so much stuff. So I went to go build this website and collect all the best stuff I had ever seen and uh, just so I could have it. And I want other people to have that too. My site is their site. It's I don't get views, hits, anything. I just want people to, I can't remember all this stuff. I'm not like like Mondo Gonzalez. He, you can ask him any verse and that guy just has it memorized where it is and exactly what it says. I can't do that. So I have to like write a lot of this stuff down and sometimes people say, I'll, I'll listen to it later. So you just give them the website and say, okay, well, when you're ready, whatever's interesting, go do that. Because everything is on there from archaeology to creation. And there's just so much good stuff collected on there. And they can well, look with, at it. With hmm? that, let's uh, I'll walk folks over to your website. And then let's jump right into our talk on uh the watermarks of divine inspiration. I'll give a little introduction to that. And then I'm going to have you take off with the first point. So folks, okay. let me share Sean's website here. Yeah. It's the stuff on this site that uh, blew my socks off. It's, uh, it's the stuff that made me sit back and like, even when I went to collect this, it was, um, I didn't well, know how much there was. Your website is not showing up. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It's just too funny. Um, see if I move it, if it, if it shows up. It's theoretically, this should give me every tab I have open, and it is not giving me your tab, which I opened just to show the folks your website. I have a share app. Oh, here it is. It came up. Now no. it showed up. Okay, here we go. 
Oh, yeah, there it is. All right, folks, here is Sean's website. It's called It Has Been Written. So if you go to ithasbeenwritten.com, you can find his website. And he has a ton of cool stuff on there. You can see his tabs here. He's got science and creation theories, tangible evidence, history of the Bible, history of the writings. He has stuff on prophecy. He's got a lot of amazing stuff on here. He's got a lot of links that he's put up from men like uh, Chuck Missler. So if you love Chuck Missler's stuff, there's a boatload of it here on his website. So it has been written. Okay. Yes, sir. Every question I've ever been asked or had, I try to address it. And I know that's a large statement, but there's uh, very few things that aren't at least given a trailhead for. Someone's asking me to zoom my camera out. So see if I can figure out how to do that. Nope, I got to zoom the other way. <laughs> there we go. I don't know why my camera adjusted itself. This has been a bizarre evening. I've had like three or four things just really freaky go crazy on me. and But that happens once in a while when we're doing the work of the Lord. All right, folks, the reason we're here tonight is not just to talk about Sean and hear about his website and hear about his conversion and his journey through apologetics. Uh, it is an interesting story, and I hope that you guys will get to know Sean a little bit better. He's got lots of cool material on his website. But we want to talk about the divine watermarks of divine inspiration. And what do I mean by that? I mean the evidence beyond the teachings of the scriptures themselves that are in the Bible, that are like God putting his fingerprints on the Bible, letting us know that this is not written by man, that it is written by God. And there's really a lot of these cool watermarks. We're going to go through some. We want to show the hidden messages of the cross tonight. If we have time, we want to go into some cool Bible codes. We're not going to go into great detail in anything. We just want to wet your whistle. We want to point out there's science in the Bible, things that ancient man wouldn't have known on his own scientific investigation. They were things that had to have been revealed by the Lord. We're going to look at prophetic typology and then prophecies in the Bible, which many of you know, these are divine watermarks. This tell us that man didn't write the Bible because Man cannot foretell the future. He can make Nostradamus-like guesses and get a small batting average. I mean, if I just started rattling off prophecies like, mm, you know, I think there's going to be some drug crime in Mexico next year. And I think there probably is going to be a 7.0 earthquake in Turkey. And I bet there's going to be Russia is going to be involved in some kind of wars and nonsense. I mean, I mean, what are the odds that I'm going to bat 100% on this? But is this really prophecy? It, that's not prophecy. That's not the way God works. God will give a name like Cyrus, give it decades or centuries ahead of time, tell you about the man, raise the man up, and that man will do exactly what God says he's going to do. Uh, God can foretell the fall of Nineveh, foretell the fall of Tyre, and it will come to pass exactly as he said. He can foretell the fall of Jerusalem, and it will happen. And it will happen by the people he said it was going to happen. But at any rate, I digress. We want to go in right now. We're going to start with the first watermark. And this is pictures and messages of the cross outside of just the plain statements of Scripture. So, Sean, why don't you take over here? All right. Yeah. A lot of times when you start trying to reach people, there's two sentences they'll start with. And one is, Bible's just a book written by men to control people. Right? That cannot be farther from the truth. And that's what we're going to go over. Um, one of the ones I like a lot is um, the picture of the cross in the tabernacle. Um, Chuck Missler used to go on about this. And I delivered it a few times on Facebook just to, and some people will argue against it, but the four camps in Numbers 2 were isolated to each cardinal direction in reference to the camp. So north, west, east, south. There it is. 
And when I put this up, if you count the numbers, it does actually make the amount of the numbers of the camps does create that size. And if they maintained a strict boundary to the cardinal direction of that camp and the size of its wall, that's exactly what it would look like. Even if they didn't maintain a stick strict boundary and they formed lines that bled out at the sides, it'd still be a cross. Like, you'd still see it if you ever went up there. There are these crosses all throughout the Old Testament, and they're hidden there. And, you know, if people ever go and look at how many of these there are, like, how many of them can you actually dismiss before you say, well, all of those were total coincidences. And yes, it's true, there are cross shapes, like even telephone poles, but wait till you see what's here and where they're located and what they're located in. Um, if you want to dismiss it, this is what faith is about. It's like God has done so many things in so many ways for us to go, wow, okay, there's something to this, and this is one of them. So that is the first one I wanted to talk about. Um, there are other smaller ones like um, – it's a little bit later here. I don't know where I mentioned it, but I'll just stick to our outline for now. Um, the next one was when Moses raised the brass, brass serpent on a pole um, with a snake on it. The first time I heard that, it definitely boggled my mind. Like, who are you calling a snake, pal? Like, because <laughs> the person I know who went on a uh, cross was no snake, but then you see where it's explained in other verses that that snake represents our sin, that Jesus was hung on a pole, and cursed is anyone who was hung on a pole. Um, that, was, that was in the Old Testament. Uh, Numbers 21, 8 and 9, and this was alluded to in Deuteronomy 21, 23. His body shall not remain overnight on a tree, but you shall surely bury him on that day. So that you do not know, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. And it's explained again in Galatians three thirteen. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, "Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree." And again in Second Corinthians five twenty one, for he hath made himself to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made righteous of God in him. And as you mentioned in the outline here, uh, the cross is prophesied in the Gospels. And I, this is in John 12, 32, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This is, this he said, signifying by what he, what death he would die. What's really um, cool about some of this stuff I remember as a young believer, I'm I'm a very young Christian. I'm reading my Dake's Annotated Study Bible, the King James Bible. And they came across this passage about Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness in Numbers 21. And I was new to typology. To be honest, I was a babe in the Lord. I had no idea that there was such thing as typology. I yeah. read the New Testament through a few times. I'd read the Gospels through a few times. And so I, I, I started to have a good handle on what Christianity was. And I thought, I need to read the Old Testament. So <laughs> I started reading through the Old Testament. Yeah. And I get into the account of Abraham offering his son Isaac, and I about fell off my chair. You've got yeah. to be kidding me. This yeah. is a picture of God offering his own son. And God's going to provide the sacrifice. Well, of course, you go through Genesis, you go through Exodus, Leviticus, you get to Numbers, and then I see this serpent raised up. I said, you've got to be kidding. Man could not have written this book. This yeah. can only be the Lord. And I love this picture of the serpent lifted up because, the you know, at first, you, if, if you're a pagan, you're going to think, oh, this is a cool pagan symbol. Yeah. Um, yeah. And... Um, and if you're a Christian who's not deep into typology, the typology of the scriptures, you're going to say, boy, this is weird. Why would the Bible have this like pagan symbology here? Folks, this is not pagan symbology. The, the, 
The pagans could borrow this if they please and abuse it if they please. They borrow and abuse everything from the Bible. This is a picture of Jesus Christ becoming the sin of the world. That's what this is. He became a serpent bearing all of our sin. If you put all the sin of the world on a person, you turn him into the devil. The devil is represented by the serpent because every sin in this world was instigated by the devil. And so you put all the sin on Jesus, turn him into the serpent. That's what the picture is. He bore our sin. What an amazing picture. Yeah, I'm amazed by that. Like you said, uh, the devil basically takes everything good and uh, warps it. Even now, the longer time takes on, the more you Google stuff that's from the Bible. I keep on finding movies. Every movie that comes out seems to be like you can't actually find the the definition from the Bible. It's getting harder and harder. And it's I'm like, man, it's incredible how many movie titles are are ruining that <laughs> ability to search for these things. And the more you figure out the inclination, it's easy for evil to hide amongst the inclination of men because men are inherently, we tend toward evil. It's the easier path. It's the more seductive. And um, so evil can hide amongst that very easily under in disguise. And it's frustrating. But anyway, I see it now. I didn't then. And uh, that's what we're here to talk about. So by um, the way, before we go on, um, if, if you'd heard about the uh, the way the encampments were laid out in the wilderness, made a picture of the cross, if you'd heard about that before, give us a thumbs up. I'm just kind of curious if, if this is new to some of you folks, uh, brand new, or if you'd heard it before from someone like Chuck Missler. The other thing I want to point out about this encampment in the wilderness, this is a picture of Jesus Christ tabernacling yeah. in the middle of the camp of Israel yeah. and then just overlaying his cross upon the entire nation. What a picture that is. You're going to make me cry. I'm trying not yep. to cry. <laughs> but All right. Now, this, this next one that you, you were going to bring up, Sean, I'm really excited about this one. This one is so cool. So let's talk about the donkey yeah his 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 mercy is sown throughout all these things and that's what moves me emotionally so much it's like you find these things you see the typology and then at the core of it is his love like it's not it's not just to blow our socks off it's also to show like hey i love you every single one of these so not only are you coming to faith in him you're realizing he loves you now <clears throat> When I was a little boy, I always thought it was so weird that Jesus came in on the foal of a donkey. Why a foal of a donkey? Like a donkey, okay. He's being humble. But as you see there, if if I was riding into town, knowing exactly what I was going to do there, knowing the importance of the cross, and I'm sitting on the back of that, looking at that, I can tell you one thing that would be on my mind. Some people... There's always someone to d dismiss these, but um, the foals of donkeys and the foals in particular have a very distinct cross on their back. Um, that was prophesied in Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt the foal of a donkey. Uh, you know, when you first read that without the knowledge of what the foal of a donkey looks like, because I had never seen one, uh, I thought that was weird. And now that I see one, there it is, another cross. Hmm. Let's put the other donkey up. There, this one's really clear. Yeah, Jesus' perspective there. Hmm. I find it interesting that, you know, the Lord could have chosen to ride in on a fancy horse mm. or, or a Norwegian fjord horse, which were coveted by the wealthy people. 
The yeah. Phoenicians traded in them. He could have rode in on a zebra, which would have been super cool. I mean, he could have rode in on a camel. He could have rode in on um, a, a number of different animals. He could have came in on a chariot. But that he came in on this donkey. Um, yeah. I'll bet after the fact, some of his disciples, after the fact of the cross and the resurrection, his disciples were thinking, man. <laughs> now I see it. Yep. The, um, the connection, you're riding an animal into town that has a cross on its back, a picture that you're here, your king is coming for the cross. These are everywhere. Like he was wrapped in swaddling cloth, and apparently they did that for baby lambs to keep them yep. from moving around. So yep. these guys would have arrived seeing this king wrapped like a lamb already a type yep in a manger and they brought him frankincense gold and myrrh which represented you know divinity myrrh for the embalming and uh what was the other one the gold of kingship yep. and it's it, like these are everywhere and i don't know them all and i'll never probably know them all until i cross over but um i love that they're here and i love finding them and it feels like I'll never, like, we'll, we'll keep going, we'll keep talking about yeah. some of them. One thing I think is interesting, too, about these donkeys is it doesn't matter what part of the world mm. uh, that donkey is from. Yep. All the continents where they have donkeys, the donkey foals always have the cross on their back. I mean, you might be able to find one in a million that doesn't, but yeah. donkey foals have the cross on their back. And even the adult male or adult donkeys if you give them a good cutting you'll still find that cross down there in their lower hairs on their back i read the earliest recorded uh documentation of this was like 1400 bc yeah so there's plenty of time there but um what's interesting too is what this implies you put two and two together the way god works when God was making his plan of redemption, he created the donkey foal with the cross on its back because right. he was going to use that donkey foal with the cross on his back for his triumphant entry. That's and, how I feel. Yeah. Yep. Jupiter, I mean, he's done that with Jupiter for the, you know, Revelation 12 sign. Like he's the God of all things. He's made things for a reason, for analogies, yep. for purposes. And just these little these little confirmations that, oh yeah, I did, I made that too. You, you truly, if you study all things, they declare His glory, and that's what I love about the first three pages of the site is they're all creation based. So like, you go study the Word, and you can't like people people can get numb. You can get numb reading, and if that ever happens, go back to creation, and then it's like looking at God his evidence again. And then you're like, oh, I want to read the word again. And then you read the word again and you can keep on like bringing yourself up like this. And there's always, there's always great ways that, like you said earlier, when I read the new Testament, I was like, I have got to read the old Testament. I didn't like, I always tried starting with the old Testament first when I was a kid and it just didn't work out for me. But when I read the new Testament, I had the fire in my belly to go figure this stuff out. Cause I, I wanted to understand revelation and I had no idea what it was talking about. But moving along, um, well, prophecies. Let's move into the prophecies on the cross. Yeah. This is a cool subject. You want to take this one? No, I, I, right. I just want to give a little introduction, and then I'm going to have you walk through the passages. Okay. One thing I think is interesting about these prophecies on the cross is when most of these prophecies were written, crucifixion didn't exist yet. Yeah. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians uh, around 300 to 400 BC. It wasn't perfected until the Roman Empire. The Romans took a very painful form of death and made it probably the most painful form of execution that man has ever come up with. And so there's a number of prophecies in the Old Testament that give us details about this death. So why don't you walk us through this, Sean? 
well, you just about brought me to tears. So thanks for that. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, okay. Yeah, I actually thought that it was a. Uh, I had heard it was Romans. You had uh, informed me it was Persians first, then Romans, which is. Yeah, it's it's a common historical mistake. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I make plenty of those, but the stuff is here, and it's not like. And there's going to be disagreements too. And I don't ever want people to be discouraged when those happen, because this right. is why we're doing this is like, there's a lot of reasons for faith. So if a disagreements happen, it don't, don't feel like somebody's taken a pillar out from underneath your faith, but just go find out what the truth is and you'll be all right. Cause there's plenty of it. Um, okay. So Psalm 22, 16, the company of evil doers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Now, when was Psalm 22 written, sir? That was early. We're yeah. talking, I mean, the Psalms were all written, generally speaking, in David's area, era or shortly thereafter. Okay. Now, I've had to write down when most of this stuff was written. I have a whole chart about when each book was written. Um, Psalms is a little bit more complicated because there's several different writers. But for, if you ever want to look up when things were written, that chart is there. And on your website. Yes, on my website. And there's also timelines and such. But um, when the Jews, or well, Israelites or Jewish people try to say that the prophets didn't, Jesus isn't there, I'm just like, who do you think that was? But we'll, we'll move on because it's all of the prophets are very specific. Um, Psalm 22, wasn't that the one uh, Jesus quoted when he said, uh, my father, why have you forsaken me? I believe so. Let me pull up the 22nd Psalm here. I didn't understand. Like, I always wondered that verse, and I had finally read the Psalms for myself. And when I got to that, I was like, ah, he was quoting Psalms, Jesus. And yeah, yep. Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you fors forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Yeah. This has stumbled a lot of unbelievers, but you know why this stumbles the unbelieving world? Because they don't understand how grave the sin and unbelief issue is, and they don't understand that that the death of God's own son was the absolute only way to redeem mankind. I struggle with that. I don't know. I mean, I know everybody does, but... You can have faith in God, but having having an understanding of the result of our sin, how it directly yep. affects the physical world, um, is a hard thing to comprehend. I prayed a very dangerous prayer not too long ago that God helps me understand the effects of my sins. Oh, boy. If you're brave, pray that prayer. He'll answer it. <laughs> um, moving along, Zechariah 12.10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him who they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. I'm going to be right back, Sean. Keep going. Zechariah 13, 6. Um, and one will say to him, what are these wounds in your hands? Then he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And as most people know nowadays, Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned, every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Um, also on my site, in the prophecy section, there are countless um, examples of how Christ himself fulfilled such oddly specific prophecies and also after he died. How do you, how do you fake that? Like 
some of these things he would not be able to control when he was, you know, in the tomb. And one of those examples is Potter being paid 30 pieces of silver, buried like a rich man. And uh, he's from Bethlehem. He's crucified, as I said he would be, lineage of Abraham and David. Um, his beard was going to be ripped. All these things, like, they're endless. I have 360 of them. You said that there's like 100 of them that Jesus fulfilled himself. And uh, there's even a, a friend of mine who did do the probability of these things. And, you know, I want to tell people the probability of these things, but you just end up laying a number on them that I think goes over their head. It's, yeah. it's far greater than the lottery. And some people can act. Um, to about 65 to 70 of the prophecies concerning Jesus, you're now such vast odds that you reach what they call statistical impossibility. Hmm. Um, the, the number is so vast that it it's it's not even remotely possible. I now there's over a hundred. <laughs> yeah, so there's over a hundred uh, major prophecies of the Lord Jesus in his in his life, his, his birth, his life, in his cross. But if you take all of the individual details that make it up, men have counted them out. There's well over 300 of them. Jeez. I find this absolutely fascinating. And so here you have a God who put a Bible together, didn't merely foretell that Jesus was going to die on the cross. He gave it in so many details, with so many associations, with so many connections, that it would be absolutely impossible for this to have happened simply by chance. If he just left it that you're going to have a Messiah-type figure that's going to die on a cross, well, there's probably a few dozen uh, rebels in, in Jerusalem and in Judea that died on crosses who who are messianic type figures over the centuries. But you start throwing in all these other details and you quickly go from long shot to statistical improbability to statistical impossibility. If you, and this stuff has been recorded outside and I collected that too on the history of the writings page. Like people often bring up like uh, Tacitus and Lucian yep. and all these guys and Josephus. I ended up reading that uh, Iniquities of the Jews. And you don't have to like sit down and read a book. A lot of people, like if I'm doing yard work or mowing a giant lawn, I'll put it on an audio book and listen to it. And I actually yep. listen a lot better. <laughs> so there's, I do that with the Bible too. The, the only downside is I have no idea what verse I'm on when it happens because I'm listening to it. But it'll get in there and it's a great way to let it get in there. And um, these things are, they're truly recorded and wow, getting some outside. If you go reading some of these outside sources, it's just like these people's perspectives, just Jesus existed. They saw him. Some of them dismissed it as magic. Some of them said he had a demon. Some of them just said, you know, whatever, but he existed and there is a lot of evidence for it. And, um, it's collected. Can you go to the, um, can you go to the tangible evidence section for me? Oh, let's see. Was that a slide? Can you see what I'm doing? Mm -mm. Okay. On, on my site, on the tangible evidence, there's all these bulas. There's all these videos from like Joel Kramer. Oh, um, okay. Yep. Do you have an option to share your page? Grab a bush. Okay, share I your. I understand. Proceed. Share your screen. Do I? Did I give you permission to share? Do I need to? I'm, I'm clicking through it. Um, window. Entire screen. I'm happy with that. Yep. Share. You can do a window. Is that working? Oh, here we go. Let me load it. Show it on the stream. Whoop. All right. Does that work? Can you see it? Well, we got something going here. 
What does it look um, like? We've got a whole bunch of weird pictures, though. That's not quite working right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Just share the tab. Stop sharing. Share. I understand. Chrome tab. Select a tab to share. Oh, that's a Chrome tab. I want to share the entire screen. Do it. Technology. Yeah, there we go. Chrome does not have a one. Can you can you do it? Um, yeah, let's see if I can. Okay, which one do you want me to share? Tangible evidence, and just scroll down, if you could, please. Okay, and how far? Um, just if you show like the first right at the top, you'll see all these bulas from the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah's captors, King has all those little, um, those little looks like seals. Yeah. Yep. These okay, are me... some of the evidences that I've collected. I've gotten a lot of them. Below that, okay. you'll see like forty Bible archaeology facts, like the Cyrus cylinder and uh, the city of David. Herodium, and then that's what you wanted right here. Let me minimize that. Yep, that's it. And then everything below that, you'll if you keep going, you'll also see like Tacitus and uh, Lucian and all the other various evidences. I've done my Here's best. Here's some to cool videos. Oh, those videos are amazing. I still watch this stuff a lot myself, and um, I use this site a lot. I don't know how I witnessed without it because people want evidence nowadays. And I was just talking uh, to Mondo a minute ago and he was saying, it's incredible how much Joel Kramer has taken off. And I'm like, people are hungry for evidence and weird stuff is happening. People want answers. They want to see if there's anything to the Bible. And the first question is evidence. So I love the patterns of evidence stuff. Oh, me too. That's so good. See, one, is. one thing I think is fascinating about this brother is uh, um let me stop sharing here i um mm -hmm. I, I find it super super fascinating uh, you mentioned earlier that people come up with all these you know wild stories about all the, the bible's just written by men mm -hmm. obviously men were involved in writing the bible but mm -hmm. if anyone honestly approaches the bible and honestly approaches the archaeological and historical evidence for the Bible and the um, internal evidence for the Bible, they will be forced to believe that the Bible is indeed the Word of God and that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. The mm -hmm. only reason men will turn away from this light is they love their sin more than they love truth. And, and that's really problematic. Yeah. There's probably two dozen autobiographies and biographies written of men in the last hundred years who were things like news writers, uh, uh, investigators, lawyers, men of savvy minds who started weighing the evidence, trying to prove that the, the gospels can't be trusted, that Jesus isn't real. And these guys, as they weighed the evidence, ended up being against their will convinced mm -hmm. that Jesus was who he said he was and the Bible's the word of God. And there's so much evidence out here, folks. You could literally spend four decades, eight hours a day, studying the evidence for the historicity and authenticity of the scriptures that's from archaeology, that's from history, and you yeah. would never get to the bottom of it. I can attest to that. I actually had like a year off work and I sat down on my coffee table in my living room every day. I was so thirsty to know more because I wanted to go share this with people I loved, cared about, was worried for. So I really put my effort into it. And the more I looked, the more I wanted to look. And I just couldn't stop myself. My wife definitely thought I lost my mind. <laughs> but I said, think of it like school. I just need to get an education right now because apparently I have a lot to learn. But um it's there, like you just said. Um, shall we move along so that we don't take? Yeah, yeah. We have a, a, the next cool section here is the timing of the cross. Not only did 
did the Lord give us details about what would happen on the cross and who was going to die there. He gave us the timing of the cross ahead of time. So, Sean, why don't you walk us through that? Okay. This is a hot button for some people because it does. We have a day count, 173,880 days. And it starts. Why don't you start back up to um, uh, Daniel chapter 9? Let's go through that passage so people get some context. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So this happened. And this is another one of those prophecies and a type, like it happened then and it is a very involved thing and you can i spent weeks just trying to wrap my head around the basis of this stuff and try to figure out when the decree was and try to figure out when messiah was cut off and i did all of this myself before i let anybody cloud my thoughts with other other stuff and what i ended up finding i, I punched it into i i settled on a start date and an end date now we can argue about that until the cows come home. But when I did this in my coffee table at home, I punched in the 173, 880 days, determined the 360 degree year, all that stuff. And it landed right on the death day that I, that I settled on. So here I am like, holy moly, <laughs> like this is a really specific prophecy. And yep. it says, what I had done is it gives you a list. It says first there's the elders, uh, then comes judges, is it? And then kings, and then prophets, and then there will be. I didn't. I didn't put all this together. I was just making a timeline, and then I had this huge gap where I'm like, "What is this gap? How come we have the elders, the judges, the kings, the prophets, and then this gap?" And then I was like, "Let's well, see how long this gap is here." And I was like, "Hang on a second. That's the Daniel gap. That's the gap of 69 weeks. And then I had figured out the decree and the end and all this. And um, let's, I know people argue about exactly when that fits, but even if you move it forward or back a year, like we are onto something here. And this, even pulling that off is not doable. Unless yes. you've got Let, let's walk the folks through a little bit here. Where the 173,880 days comes from, is you notice they mention uh, 70 weeks, but then they mention 7 and 62. The, these weeks are weeks of years. So the 70 years is 400 and or 70 weeks is 490 years. The 69 weeks is 483 years. Now, where we get the, um, the length of the year is in the book of Revelation, which is way out in the future. When mm. you go through the 42 months, the three and a half years, the 1260 days, you realize, oh, in the book of Revelation, the days are 360 years long, or the years are 360 days long. They're not 365 and a quarter days. I confirmed it there. Yeah. There's so another you, one. So you take the 360-day year from the 70th week and you go back to the 69 weeks and you you multiply 483 years by 360 days and you come up with 173,880 days. And then you, you're going to be measuring from... It's usually understood to be the command that was given in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. People differ a year or two on what year that was. You'll have some that think it's 444 B.C., some it's 445 B.C. Uh, depending upon which date you end, you're going to end out there at 32 or 33 A.D. Some people back the whole thing up one more year and end up like 31 A.D. Um, but these are this is horseshoes and hand grenades, folks. Doesn't matter which year you're working from, which year you're going to, you're going to be in this 173,880 day range. And I think this is absolutely fascinating. The, the, the 
promises in the prophecies in the Bible that mention time periods are exact, folks. God is an exacting God, and his numbers are exact. I've shown the math too, like, and I think a lot of people do go wrong is that there's an astronomical calculations uh, are always a year off if it's BC. Um, so you, one could argue that 445 and 444 is the exact same year. If, yep. if this math is how I settled doing it, and I did settle at 32, but, um, you know, like you said, I don't hold on to any, especially in something like this. I don't hold on to it incredibly tight because I know I'm trying to figure some of this stuff out and I'm a human. Yep. Um, this Bible is like a flower and it's constantly, you know, blooming and changing and God has built it that way by design. He even says to seal up the words till the end. Like there's things that develop and we understand better. So to act like you can never just go, I got it all. Like <laughs> it's just, that's not going to happen for me especially with my memory but um there's other things that kind of make you wonder and go hmm like the ASEAN calendar that ken johnson is talking about um he's got a lot of very interesting points and then there's the resurrection timing uh there's a lot of different things that we can go and i've shown sir robert anderson's stuff that he said in his book uh the coming prince and i know todd Hampson, I believe his last name is, says there's another guy who he believes is onto something. So like, go look at them all, go see, go see what's there. And it's not like nothing. <laughs> I can tell you that it's amazing stuff. And again, that's in the prophecy section of it has been written. If you'd like to see the math on that and use a calculator and do what I've gone through. I, I wish I knew how to use the a pointer here um, on the screen for the next one. But um, let's move on. I love this next section here. Let's move into the Bible codes. All right. What, um, what do you want the pointer for? Well, I wanted to point to to show them how it works by pointing to that to the uh, for the first one the the Tav. The I Vav. got you. I got you an image of that. It's a it's a purple image here. From okay. One of on your website. No, no, I sent you the pictures through the emails. If um, okay, I can't even Let me, even let me see screen. if I can pull it up. Um, it's, it's the very classic nature, Chuck Missler, purple and yellow. Oh, here we go. Here. Yep, there she is. Oh yeah, but it won't it won't show counting the letters in the Hebrew text. That's no. what I was looking for. Okay. Okay, but we can use this to explain. The, the Bible code, and then I'll, I'll I'll show them as best as I can how it works. Yeah, so this exists, and uh, as you pointed out, you this uh, if you count using an equidistant letter skip of fifty, starting from the first tav in Genesis. Which, by the way, what is the original Hebrew shape of a tav? Yeah, that the um, <clears throat> it's interesting how the the tav changed over time. The original yes. Phoenician shape was a T. There's no doubt about it. I didn't know that. Someone shared that with me like maybe six months ago. And yeah, uh, when you wanted to talk about this, I was like, you start counting from the top, huh? That's ironic. Um, another one of these crosses, and then even bear a sheet in if you break that down. Um, that is another incredible one. But sticking to the point here, um, counting 50 from the first Tav in Genesis, you will find the word Torah. Uh, this was something, again, Chuck Missler was into. and um, Let me I bring this honored, one back up. I must have lost it here. Honored to repeat that sort of thing. This is from one of his videos, The Torah Code. Um, and again, a lot of this stuff, If you, I mean, you can just go look up Chuck Missler, but I have saved a bunch of his Cool Let videos. me just pull up the Hebrew text really fast. Yeah, go ahead. And then we'll show them what we're looking at. And then you can, we'll explain how you find it in the five books. So let me pull up, stop sharing this. I got a screen share. See if I can pull up that. 
There we go. See if I can pull that up. Pentateuch, okay. Is that five again? Well, it's not going to let me share this window, maybe. Oh, here we go. I can share a window. There we go. Now, can you see my cursor, folks, or no? I can see the window. I can't see the cursor. But okay. I see some 22 two and. All right. So let me pull up Genesis. I see your cursor. You can see my cursor? I sure can. Okay. So here in Genesis, we're going through, this is Bare Sheet. And right here at the end of the first word is the first Tav. And so we start counting from here and we count out 50 letters and we end up with, uh, I believe it's this Vav right here. And then you count again. And it brings you to the hay. Um, and then um, and then what's, oh, and then, yeah. Anyway, that's how you just keep counting. You count those letters out like that. Yeah, T-O-R-H. Oh, yeah. So it's the, I, that's where I went wrong. I have to have the, the uh, it's the top, the T, the O, or the W. The ro the race or the R and then the H. So this is probably the R right here. Yeah, and then you go find the last H, which is somewhere out in here. But anyway, mm -hmm. let me um go back into your stream now. And you can show them. I think I sent you the bare sheet breakdown in um the uh proto. Hebrew. It says, uh, break down to sun, God destroyed, hand cross. And that's the yeah. Tav. And um, that that's pretty weird that if you take that part, that word apart, it's sun, God destroyed, hand cross. Yeah. But also that we're counting 50 from starting from the cross. And in the middle, you have what everything's pointing to there. Yeah. So I find it fascinating that if you do this. If you find the first Tav in the book of Genesis, you count 50 letters, you find the Vav, you count 50 letters, you find the Resh, you count 50 letters, you find the He, it says Torah. You go to the book of Exodus, you find the first Tav, you count 50, 50 and 50, you get Torah again. So Genesis and Exodus both say Torah. You go to Leviticus, you count, you find the first Yod, you count 50, you get hey. Count 50, you get vav. Count 50, you get hey. So mm. then it's Jehovah or Yahweh. You yeah. go to numbers and you find the first hey. And you count 50 and then 50 and then 50. And you have Torah backwards. You go to Deuteronomy, find the first hey. Count 50, you get a resh. Count 50, you get a vav. Count 50, you get a tav. And you have Torah backwards. So you've got two copies of the Torah looking forwards to Jehovah and two copies looking backwards to Jehovah. What this reminds me of is we've got the Old Testament law pointing forwards to Jesus Christ, who's God manifest in the flesh. And then in the tribulation, when they return to the law for the last seven years, that law is going to point backwards to the crucified Messiah, who is God manifest in the flesh. This is such an example, folks, that the purpose of the law was to point to Jesus, who is God manifest in the flesh. And the odds of this happening are, are mind-boggling that this would randomly happen. You can find these equidistant skips in any book. I and mean, you can take Moby Dick and just do equidistant number skips and find random words. Um, that's common. It, it just it just happens. And so you'll find bug and rug and, and bathtub and find some interesting words in just about any document. But to find this kind of a pattern with the equidistant letter skipping is tremendously amazing. 
I have a hard time dismissing this as coincidence. Oh, it's impossible for this to be coincidence. Yeah. <clears throat> and again, this is, you know, some I've, I cringe when people say you can't prove God. And I understand why they're saying that, but <sighs> I can hear Chuck, old Chucky going, yes, you can. <laughs> you can prove God. <laughs> In my opinion, you can. And my job as yeah. a mechanic was very similar. Like you're looking for evidence. The more honest you are with yourself, the better chance you have of fixing that car. And um, this is the same. Like you base your conclusions off of evidence. You go do the thing. And if it works, you've, there's your feedback. And you're like, okay, well, what more do you want out of something? Like this is incredible stuff. Yeah. So I love it. And I love finding these things. And uh, I don't know who counts this stuff or who has who likes math that much, but it's not me. But I'm glad they did. <laughs> well, a lot of the equidistant number counting um, originally was done by Jewish rabbis who manually spent decades studying this stuff. Well, now mm. you can just take um, a database of the entire Hebrew Bible, just letter by letter, put it all in there. Um, and, and just start making number counts. You, you just program it to take all the uh, num seven equidistant skips, all the eights, all the tens, all the twenties, whatever you want to find. Mm -hmm. And it'll find up all the patterns and, and point out known Hebrew words. It's, it's a pretty interesting thing. Now, I think what people need to understand, when you find these hidden Bible codes, there's no new revelation here. This isn't something that you're supposed to learn this number code stuff so that you can get the really true deep insight into Bible prophecy or the real knowledge of God. Um, the number codes are not here to give us uh, extra revelation. What they are is simply a divine watermark that proves that this Bible has the fingerprints of God all over it. Now, the text itself and the truth itself is, is all the proof that we would ever need. But I think God has gone above and beyond the call yes. of duty for the human faith. And he's got a number of different watermarks that authenticate the scriptures as truly the word of God. We can't talk about them all. There's a lot of them, but it's exactly it. You can go too far with everything. And uh, this is certainly one of them that seems to be a, uh, one of those things people go too far with, but that's people. We all do it. And, uh, but it is still cool stuff and we can still look at it. And, um, I love it. I love finding these things. I'm so grateful that we've lived in a time where so many people have gotten so many answers and you know, all I have done is collected it. Um, it's a very easy task. All you're doing is putting things in a box, but <laughs> they're out there and there's a lot of it. So praise God for that. Because we are running out of time and people are going to need it. we got to go tell them. Yeah, um, I, just, I just find it so fascinating that God hasn't left himself without a witness. I mean, when you start thinking of the amazing typologies in the Bible, when you think of the number codes and the number patterns that are in the Bible, and you start thinking of the prophecies that are in the Bible, um, anybody that honestly proves uh, approaches the Bible, trying to find out if it's true or false, is not only going to find out that God explains himself for every thorny philosophical problem and find out that God explains himself for every thorny moral problem. They're yeah. going to find these watermarks. Yep. And I don't know why I'm going to bring this up, but I'm going to bring this up. You know, a lot of people, I, I run into people all the time on Twitter Oh, your God sends people to hell and your God drowned all those people in the flood. And they really find fault with God over stuff like this. And your God yes. uh, sent the Jews into the Holy Land and they committed genocide. I think people don't really understand what was going on there. Yeah. Yeah. God doesn't just randomly send a bunch of Protestants into a Catholic country. And so I want you to remove the Catholics. He doesn't send the Catholics into a Protestant country. I want you to remove the Protestants. I mean, if this stuff happens, this is purely the man and, and purely the devil. But 
What we had in the land of Canaan, for instance, there was two problems that were very, very acute moral problems that God absolutely had to deal with. The first one was the Canaanites were some of the most pagan, evil people that have ever walked the planet. Yes, They were sacrificing their children. There was cannibalism there. Um, they were immoral in every way that man can be immoral. They yeah. were ungodly people. And the Lord didn't want that to defile his people. He he already had a pattern of removing that kind of wickedness in the flood, and that's really what he did in Canaan. But there was another problem there that a lot of people don't understand. The human bloodline was tainted with angelic DNA. Yeah. And that was widespread amongst the Canaanites. That's why there were giants, for instance, among the Philistines. Yeah. Uh, men that were the short ones were eight feet tall. The 12 ones were the tall ones were 12 feet tall or bigger. These were monstrous men. Yeah. And and but there were other strains of that Nephilim or that angelic DNA that didn't just make people giants. Sometimes it just enhanced people in a way that made them uh, much more communicative with uh, the fallen realm. Mm. Um, it, it increased their, their brain capacity. They were getting their science and their technological advancements from the other side, from the far side. So mm. this was the evil that was there. It was the, the t potential for DNA tainting of the bloodline and wickedness of the worst kind. So folks, this wasn't genocide when the Lord brought Israel into the promised land. Earlier, he'd said, I don't want you to go into the promised land yet because the iniquity of the Amorites isn't full. He gave the Amorites 40 years more from the time Israel left Egypt to give them 40 more years to repent and get right. And they basically didn't except for a few individuals. So this was God just removing the worst evil from the planet to make it possible for good to actually take root and grow. Totally. And I have, on the evil and power section of it has been written, there's a bunch of L.A. Marzulli stuff. Oh, yeah. Mind-blowing. Those are so worth watching. And uh, again, you can get these audio books. I kept on getting books that the Bible mentioned, like Jasher, Book of Jubilees, all these things. And um I keep on seeing this author, Ken Johnson, on the bottom of these books. I'm like, who's this Ken Johnson guy? And one day he showed up on uh, Prophecy. Was, hey, it's Ken Johnson. There he is. And uh, yes. wow, that guy, holy moly, YouTube, there's all these people. There's this YouTube community of people that you can, if you want the answers, they are out there. You can find these people. I've collected a lot of them. Um, go learn it because there's plenty of it. Your videos are like, I can't watch them all, but um, wow. The ones that I have watched, I'm just like, this is fantastic. You, you obviously don't sleep or eat, so thank you for that and all the lessons. Um, well, did you want to go into this of uh, the genealogy in Genesis? Did you want to walk through that? Um, we have a lot of genealogies. We have the Matthew genealogy, the Genesis genealogy. There's um, then well, the there's one I the, was um, thinking about, and maybe this isn't the one you were thinking about. But uh, Chuck Missler and a few others have brought out that you take the genealogy from Adam yeah. forwards. I forget whether it's the first 12 or 16 generations, but there's a series of names. Yes. When you go through the names, it's an amazing story. Yes, I do want to go through that. I love oh, that. Right. That is one of my favorites. Um, you also talked about the um, Jeconiah and Curse and that genealogy and that. Is amazing too, but these the list of names. Um, I, I actually think that whole Jack and I subject. I think sometime we should do a video just on the genealogies in the Bible, particularly the genealogy of Matthew and the genealogy in uh, the other uh, the other one, the Luke, I believe it is, and yeah. uh, and go through those two genealogies. Talk about the Jack and Knight curse. Uh, and, and then talk about the different problems in the Lord's genealogy. Uh, that the genealogies itself yes. is an amazing tale. I think we should do that sometime. But okay. anyway, let's go back to this genealogy in Genesis. 
I think the most I've ever been kicked in the gut by a non-believer was with that genealogy. He's like, hey, you realize that Jesus was born of a virgin, right? So how could he have come from the line of David? And he blew my mind because I didn't know. And I was, I, I was like, that's an excellent point. Let me go look into that. Now I have both the genealogies. I understand the, all that. And it, the answer behind that was so much better. And I wish I had it at that time. The guy told me that. <laughs> but <laughs> it's there too, also at the site, if you ever want it. The other time, um, genealogy in Genesis. Yes. Redemption story you have here. Yep. And the list is too long to name the message to be random by chance. And uh, that is what we're going over, did you say? Yeah, let's do that one. All right. Do you have a slide for that, or do, are you just going to read the list off one at a time? Well, what I've done is gone to the link I have at my site, where is that great video a lot of people have seen it. It's like a black background, and there are all these um, – Which, which major are you on? It's called Bible – codes.org and um which link is it under if you go to my site and yep. you go to history of the writings okay and scroll down it is the second video oh names uh -huh. and bible codes yes names and bible codes there's a link to the left of that Okay. Called 1260d.com. Oh, there we go. Yeah, click on that, and then that will take you to the name meanings from Adam all the way up to Jesus. Okay, so let's can... just, here's the first slide right here. So let me play that for you. You going to play a video? No, I'm going to just show that, that part of your website. Oh, all right. There we go. Oh, well, that's their yeah, that's their website. But this is on my website, and yeah, yeah, this this was incredible, and it's true. These names are given, and this spans four thousand years. So these people existed. You can find evidence for some of them, um, and the names that are given are given in Hebrew, and the Hebrew were, you can't hide with that language. Like the the names were given because they're like words combined. Like for example, Methuselah, his death shall bring. Um, which again, I think Methuselah is such a cool show of mercy because it was his death that was going to bring the flood. And he is the longest man to have ever lived in time. And that's just, of course, that makes sense. Yep. God is merciful. And if you follow these all the way down, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of this or seen this or done this, but um, I could try and read them quickly here. Would you like that? Yeah, well, let's just walk through them one at a time. All right, uh, it's by the top here. They start with God, and if you start with Adam, it says man, but you, you know, the God man is appointed a mortal man of sorrow is born. That's Adam, Seth, Enosh, and Canaan. Then comes Mahalalel, and if you go back to the chapters, you'll see where it'll say this is your name and this is what it means so it's not like my name Sh sean is like you know it's got an it's got a name meaning slapped onto it but it's um you know it's not hebrew and names change but these can't otherwise they'd have to change the whole hebrew language um continually continuing on the glory of god shall come down instructing that his death shall bring those in despair comfort and rest the fame of Babylon's fortress, in parentheses, but I will make Babylon fade away. And oh, sorrow. The next one. Let me let me pull the next one up. Whoops, I got to go to here. Okay. There we go. The fame of Babylon's fortress, but I will make Babylon fade away. And sorrow extend like a plant beyond the place of division at the Tower of Babel. A friend also branches out, enraged with fury. With Abraham, a glorious father, the father of a multitude, laughs as he outwits a mighty prince sees God, then joins himself to an assembly, a glorious people whom he rescued. Strangers in a strange land, captives delivered by God. 
How are you doing on the slide here? Because I can't see your screen. Uh, yep. One who praises the Lord breaks open a way into an area surrounded by a wall of great height. O my people who belong to the prince, a prophet, clothed with strength, who serves the Lord, is here. One well loved, peaceful, and who sets the people free. Well, let's stop with that one for Thank now. Um, I want to return to that first one. Okay. Um, because that's the one that every time I look at that, I am just absolutely shocked. Yeah. Um, yes. <clears throat> the, the other ones that follow after this, there's a little bit more fluidity in which way you might go on some of it. Yeah. But this first one here, the God man appointed mortal man sorrow, the glory of God shall come down instructing his death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest. I mean, this one is so crystal clear that this yeah. is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. The God man is appointed to be a mortal man given to sorrow. And then it, it goes back and starts over again. The glory of God shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring comfort and rest to those in despair. Um, what's interesting about this, the first time I heard Chuck Missler walk through this, I almost couldn't stay in my car on the highway. I was, I mean, I was so <laughs> overcome. I was like, where, where's the pull off? Where's an off ramp? I can't yeah. bear this anymore. <laughs> it's, it's official. We're Chuck nuts. I heard that was a term and I was like, oh yeah, I guess I'm a Chuck nut. <laughs> he's he's uh, shown some pretty amazing things and I'm just so grateful guys like him have gone the lengths they've gone to get the church, all these reasons for faith. What's and, interesting to me about Chuck Missler, I don't think I've ever met a man that um, that didn't think Chuck was wrong on some stuff. Many yeah. good men think here and there Chuck was just, he, he's just a little bit wild. But yeah. all these guys, they all think Chuck is one of their favorite Bible teachers. They love him to pieces. The, the man had more knowledge rattling around in his head than than <laughs> your average five preachers put together. I mean, how did the guy get that much information up there? He's like you. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't eat. 16-hour days. It's the same sort of thing. But if if there's any, like I know I watched his funeral, and um, I know they said uh, un understanding the Bible in 24 hours, they say to, to watch that. But I really like his uh, study of Revelation. And I oh. think it's pretty – that's number one on my final week page, because if you want to understand Revelation, go to that. That is just mind blowing. And I've watched it several times and I, I yep. learn something every time I watch it. So while we're on the topic. I've done Revelation a couple times. I, I think three times. I think I've done Daniel two or three times. Um, yeah, he's he's just deep waters. Yeah. So are you, my friend. So I still have plenty to learn and I forget more than I take in. But we're not here to be, you know, super duper Bible people. We just we need to be a witness and you know well, the, the, we're, we are not gonna have time to get into the prophetic types and Bible prophecy tonight. But I would like to um to to go into this the science that's in the Bible. There's okay. some really cool stuff here. And and then maybe just take a few minutes at the end and wind up just touching on the Bible's ability to change people, which I think is one of the coolest watermarks in the Bible. So um, just briefly here on the science in the Bible, what we're talking about here and what Sean is going to point out, there's information in the Bible, much of which was only discovered relatively recently by modern science. Um, but some of the ancient men knew this. How they got this knowledge is in many ways a mystery. Did they get it from the Word of God? Or was it common knowledge uh, amongst the godly that was lost? 
Um, was it knowledge that came off the ark? We really don't know. But this knowledge is in the Bible, and it's been mind-boggling to many a man to see this information in the Bible because it was modern science that discovered this stuff in the 1700s, 1800s, etc. We're in an age where uh, knowledge has increased greatly, and so new challenges are being presented. And people think they'll get you with something scientific. And there are actually quite a lot of things here um, they don't talk about because it's like, oh, that's is, uh, this whole time we've been kind of saying that uh, you're an idiot and turns out that it's true. This does happen. Yep. But um, like the arcs ratio, I think it was 35 to something, three. Um, that's one of them that they built in 1600. Turns out it's a great ratio for a ship. Ray Comfort has a little book here. Um, there's some good stuff in here. 100 Reasons uh, to Believe the Bible is Supernatural in Origin. And it's got it's a very quick little book, but there's some good stuff here. And I bought it, and um, it's like, you know, it's the stuff I'm into. I've got a lot of that scientific stuff on the site. And, like, how come we can see stars so far away? Well, it turns out Einstein's uh, theory of special relativity is got something to it where time is directly linked to gravity and that really changes the way it travels. I mean, you can get somewhere a lot faster if you don't have to take the time it takes to get there. It's complicated, but if you want to look into that, there's two ways it's been proven, such as um, the atomic clocks on satellites is one way it's been done, and the other is um, the LIGO, uh, laser interferometer measure situation where they found out when two black holes slammed into each other, um, they were able to measure the difference it created in gravity and time, which is super cool. And you can go learning about that. Um, that's on the site as well. But um, other things throughout this book and throughout the Bible are statements that are made like in Job about where the rain comes from, where it goes, the jet streams in the air, the rivers of the water, the fountains of the great deep. Um, or even in Revelation, like there's that transparent gold, which seemed to be just absolutely absurd. But now if we build nanostructures layered down in uh, ionic fashion, we can make them transparent. Um, I'm not saying we have the answer of how to make a street of transparent gold, but like just give it time, even as Chuck Missler always said, and uh, we'll get a little bit more insight to these things and find out even though it may seem like a difficult question at the time, there is science keeps on getting uh, done in a fashion that favors God. And all the founding fathers found scientific solutions a lot faster by believing in a creator. Uh, a couple of other interesting points that are often brought out in the apologetic works, and I don't know if Ray Comfort brings this out in his, but the Bible talks about the earth hanging on nothing. How in the world do you hang the earth on nothing? Yeah, that's tricky. I've never yeah. done it. And then um, the Bible talks about the poles of the earth. And so the Bible spins on two, or the, the earth spins on two poles, according to the scriptures. And we know that in reality now, too. Yeah. Um, that it spins around the North Pole and the South Pole. And yeah. And these, what's interesting about this too, is that um, the out of the, the the North Pole where we have the Northern Lights and the South Pole where we have uh, the Southern Lights, what what this is, it's electromagnetic energy that's that's uh, charged ions that are that are coming out and interacting with the energy coming in from outer space it makes electrical discharges mm. uh, in our upper atmospheres. And um, if you were to, if you could see the electromagnetic energy that's actually um, surrounding the earth, it would look like the windings on an electric motor that they come yeah. up out of the top and they curl around the globe and then they come back in. It's just like the pictures you see for, um, 
what, what it's trying to, to illustrate the energy that comes out of an electric motor's windings and then comes back around the other side. Yeah, and every time an electron jumps its little valence uh, area, if it jumps one way, it creates this color. If it jumps this way, it creates that color. And uh, the more you start like addressing science or figuring it out or what's happening there, like the 23 and a half degree tilt of those poles and then the orbit of the moon or even Neptune has one of its moons is revolving around it the opposite direction. And if you start going into some of these things that like um, Spike Sars's videos, what you're not being told about astronomy gets into more of that stuff where the more you examine it, the more you're just like, this place was designed. The atmosphere alone is so complicated. Yep. Like photosynthesis, water, all that stuff is there also at the site. Um, you learn these things and that's what I use. I use those creation pages to get to Jesus. Amen. Because it's really hard to just bring Jesus up out of thin air sometimes. But if you can like say, wow, isn't that amazing? How cool is Jesus? <laughs> you can you can start developing ways to get to Jesus quickly. Um, so, well, there's, so if a person wants to uh, to go deeper into these the science that's in the Bible, you can find not only can you find stuff uh, at the Living Waters site, you can find it Ray Comfort's book, but the Institute for Creation Research has a ton of stuff. Oh. Answers in Genesis has a ton yeah. of stuff. You know, we can just wet your whistle here, yeah. but the more a person dives into this subject, what they're going to discover, the science is buried in the pages of the scripture. Now, the Bible doesn't present this information couched in scientific language with scientific accuracy. It presents it from the perspective of a man on the street. It's, it's just common language that presents science, and it's common language that presents accurate science. Um, for instance, um, where we have common language that's, that's mentioning a phenomenon, we read in the scriptures, the sun do move. Well, we know that um, the sun doesn't actually move around the earth. We know that the earth actually moves around the sun, and the sun yeah. moves in an orbit around uh, um, in the galaxy. So, yeah. but so the Bible is approaching these things not with scientific accuracy, but with the common language of the man on the street. It's but perspective. The it, yeah. Are, yep. But the things that it says, if you investigate them, you will realize that they're perfectly keeping in harmony with science. And, and there's so much of this in the Bible. And yeah. what you're going to realize when you start digging into this that the God who wrote the book of the Bible is the same God who wrote the book of history, the same God who wrote the book of geology, the same God who wrote the book of archaeology, the same God who wrote the book of paleontology, chemistry, biology, yeah. uh, astronomy. He wrote all these books, and they're all in perfect agreement. And if we happen to find disagreement with amongst in some of these fields with each other, then we're just making a mistake somewhere because there's no disagreement. Yeah, I try to say that a lot to people too. If you think you found a contradiction in the Bible, it means that there's something you're not understanding. Go figure it out. Yeah, that's um, right. That's not like, if you say that to the wrong person, they're going to be like, well, isn't that self-healing? Um, it's not the way I mean it. It's, it's, this is for, that's something you say to Christians who believe it and yeah. know that the word of God is truth and it's not, wrong here you're just missing something go wrap your mind around it well we've got up here now to um 9 30. why don't we uh field some questions here um the typically the moderators will gather some questions and and uh i'll probably have an email here in my inbox here in the next minute or two uh with some questions that are gathered and then we can just uh go from there and the next time we we go to bat on this i think we can cover there's just so much stuff that we can cover in yes. uh, in prophecy and in pr prophetic typologies so while we're waiting for the email to come up unless i'm in the wrong email let me check my other emails here 
sometimes they take the wrong, I get the wrong email going. And if you ever want to look at prophetic types, I got like all three Pastor JDs where he does like the ways Abraham and Isaac were type Isaac and uh, Joseph Moses. Those videos are there as well as his charts. And uh, so are a lot of the prophecies and the evidence for those prophecies. Okay. All right. Here's the questions and here we go. Let me pull this over here. Okay, it says, you've mentioned in other podcasts about the Earth's core reversing. Can you expand on that? And what proof do we have? Um, I know that the magnetic poles are going to reverse, and I've talked about magnetic pole reversing. The most common thing I've talked about is the Earth's poles actually reversing. And how that would happen is if a large body rolled past the Earth like the ancients, uh, claim that happened that could cause the earth to roll it might just roll a little bit and move from its tilt to its current 23.5 degree tilt if it rolled all the way and the poles actually switched then you would go from having the sun rise in the east and set in the west to having the sun rise in the west and set in the east what's really interesting about this is that we have records ancient Sumerian Babylonian type records, ancient Chinese records, uh, ancient records from South America and, and the ancient Greek histories, a number of different histories that tell us that the earth moved from uh, the sun rising in the east to the rising in the west, and then it moved back again. And the suspicion is that, that it changed at the end of the gold age and changed back at the end of the silver age. Um, it's sometimes it's hard to get the correct dates on some of these ancient phenomena, but we read about it. Um, are there physical ramifications? If the earth uh, rolled again, for instance, let's say at the second coming and the judgments involved with the second coming, if we had another roll and it rolled just right, the uh, South Pole would roll farther north. Siberia would roll farther south. We would end up with um, Antarctica being a moderate to temperate climate. Siberia would go moderate to temperate. Um, that would be pretty amazing. That would be a physical uh, thing that could happen with this. Spiritual ramifications, um, probably not directly, but it could have... Um, spiritual uh, typology, for instance. Um, it just could be a, a symbol of blessing. Okay, when we see types or prophecies like, my God, my God, why hast you thou forsaken me? Were these viewed as prophetic in their day? What do you think, Sean? I think uh, they wouldn't have. It depends. Like, I think David knew. He, like these, a lot of these guys knew they were prophets. There's all his, even Gad was a servant of David. He was a prophet, the seer. Yep. Um, these guys knew they were prophets. And it does say in the Bible that not even the prophets fully understood what they were saying. Um, and it wasn't of their own interpretation. But they knew they were prophets. And I think, I'm sure, like if you were going through this and God's words are coming out of you, and you're in this kind of relationship with God, I am sure there are things that they did understand and things that they didn't understand. Yeah, that's uh, exactly right. Yeah. And they would have spent a lot of time wondering, I'm sure of that. Well, we read uh, the New Testament that the prophets were searching for what time and what kind of time these prophecies yeah. were going to be fulfilled. So they were exercised on it. And, and it prophet, wasn't given to them. Yeah. Prophets often gave us prophecies that they didn't understand. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been crazy to yep. go through. I often think about the prophets and what it would have been like to live like they lived, like Jeremiah, for 40 years telling people stuff. Nobody's listening. Or was it was it Ezekiel who was lowered into the, uh, the muck by ropes? Yeah. Well, no, it was Jeremiah. It was Jeremiah. And imagine what that would have felt like. Like you're, you're – <laughs> 
they did not have good lives. It was Ezekiel who laid on his side for yes. a very long time. And just imagine that, like, whenever I'm feeling down or, you know, persecuted, I think it's the prophets. <laughs> and they <laughs> went through a lot more, to say the least. And they're, the way that they left this world was no good either. Nope. I, I, you know, and we have a similar calling to the prophets in our day. Now, we don't have um, the, the strictly speaking, the thus saith the Lord, but we can have a great deal of prophetic illumination from the Lord. If we really go deep with the Lord in his word, we go deep with the Lord walking in the spirit. We seek the Lord for wisdom. We have the potential to have an amazing amount of discernment, an amazing amount of understanding of our times an amazing understanding of the scriptures and be a blessing to those around us with the prophetic message. Yeah. There's times when you can feel that stirring in your, in your spirit. And it's like, God's letting you know something and who are you going to, God is letting you know that. Yeah. It's not really something you can tell someone else, but you're feeling this and you're like, Whoa, okay. Got it. And for me, it's usually self, um, guidance for me <laughs> like it's not guidance for other people so here's another good one i spent years believing and promoting amillennial allegorical doctrine before the lord started working with me in literal interpretation does that mean that i make and love a lie and i would say not necessarily and probably not uh, when people love and make a lie they're not correctable they are committed to a lie. Now, you may have done some damage, may have had your own spiritual pride uh, when you were in that camp, but there's a difference between being a believer that's moldable and teachable and eventually gets molded and taught out of his errors than there is with someone who's so married to those errors that he can't be delivered. Yeah. A very, very big difference. Yes. And and many people who are in the camp of the truth today started off on ground that today they're ashamed of. When I look at myself as a young believer, I was not balanced as a young believer. Now, I can't entirely blame myself. I can only half blame myself. By nature, whatever I take up, I am gung-ho about it. That's I'm just wired that way. And go slow is not in my vocabulary. Go halfway is not in my vocabulary. You weren't in the military, were you? Now, I was an airborne ranger. In the <laughs> Army. But the, um, so I had that wiring issue to start with. But as a young believer, you, you're whatever you're saved into, that's what you're saved into. And you that baggage is part of you until you walk away from the baggage. And so I started off with the camp that I would regard not as balanced Pentecostal, but as hyper Pentecostal, off the wall, charismatic type stuff. That's what I had coming into me. And um, the more I got in the scriptures, the more I, I saw through this stuff and came to a position that's that somewhere's around where the uh, Calvary chapels are, a moderate, right. balanced Pentecostalism. And the um, and I also find myself identifying with historic, balanced, conservative evangelicalism, historic, balanced fundamentalism. But along the way, I walked away from charismatic and Pentecostal extremes to, to be balanced in those areas. I walked away from believing in falling away to believing in eternal security. I used to believe that the church was going to go through the tribulation. And now I hold that the church is going to be kept from the hour of trial. And we're not going to go through the tribulation. So I had a lot of error to be delivered from. And this is true for lots of men of God and lots of women of God. And what we have to do is just, not, you know, let your past be the past. It's water under the bridge. Just keep your eyes on the future and keep your eyes on what the Lord can do through you. And it may be that your connections from error in the past 
are actually going to be beneficial for you in promoting the truth in the future. And oh. it may be that your oh, yeah. understanding of the way uh, that error thinks you were there yourself is also going to help you communicate truth in the future. I think the fact that I was a hardcore, died in the wool, um, anti pre tribber for a decade, railing on pre tribbers, thinking they were dumb and thinking they were didn't know how to use the Bible and thinking they weren't being faithful. And all of a sudden, just the truth exploded on me. Well, I empathize with that camp of error now, and I know how their mind works. I know the arguments they use. I was there. So yes. anyway, be encouraged. I, I don't think it means at all that you were loving and making a lie, and you're definitely not that way today. So you said so many amazing things there. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Lord is is amazing the way he works. He he typically takes people to use that he's going to use in a big way. He takes them from hard circumstances. He takes them from backwater circumstances. He takes them, you know, not many wise, not many great or called. And that's just the way the Lord works. And he's he's very adept at taking people that start with a lot of problems and fixing them up one problem at a time until they're one of the sharpest knives in his toolbox. That's just the way he works. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've, uh, anything that I've been faced with or was confused on, I will find myself needing. It's like I go through it weeks or months before somebody is about to go ask me that same question. And I'm like, <laughs> yep. it's happened so many times now. I'm like, you're a smart feller. Yep. Now, here's an interesting question. It's really, um, is does dumb mean cuckoo or stupid, or does it mean speech? Does it have to do with speech, like speechless? And uh, personally, I think it means both. Um, we've got one sense of dumb that means unable to speak, the deaf and the dumb. And we have another sense of dumb that's also an ancient English Germanic word, and it means daft in the head or stupid in the head. So we got two different words that um, have the same spelling. I use slang sometimes that I probably shouldn't. And uh, for me, it's just basically when I say it, it's like being very human. Yep. Sean, what <laughs> software program are you using? For my operating system of my laptop? like the I, They don't really say. So I don't know if they're talking about your laptop or if they're talk, you're talking about the website. The website I use Wix. Okay. Um, it can, now that it's gotten so big, it can be very tricky. But it is, it's good to use until it gets very large. Then weird glitches do start happening. But they at least now have a um, support system. When I started, there was no support system, and I had spent many days pulling out my hair, trying to figure out how to make a website. <laughs> but I use a uh, MacBook also. And my website, I use WordPress for it, but it got so big and took so much of my time that I now, I still will load my articles myself. But lots of the back-end stuff, um, for designing and rearranging and organizing, I pay somebody to do that for me because I just don't have the time. Yeah, that's understandable. What is the consensus of Jesus' death, 32 AD? For me, yes. I've come convinced of that. Like, again, there's, there's a lot of uh, stuff on the table that makes me resolve that, but as well, because of this Daniel's prophecy, if you go back to the decree, there's a lot of things that you can go back and forth here and start cross-comparing. Um, I am completely undecided on his birth date. I've gone and tried getting into that, and um, I just get a headache. And I think I'm, I'm kind of exhausted now. After I, I did kind of learn a lot very quickly, and I needed to take a break because uh, the study of much books is wearisome. and um, I'm not sure about the birth date, but I the death date, I'm 
feeling pretty good about 32. Oh, yeah. Nice I wish I, I knew all of it for sure. Oh, yeah. Go, the time machine. Well, I had some notes here, but I was going to look for them, and I, I don't find them fast enough to bring them up. But myself, what I've observed is modern scholarship has moved more and more away from 30, 31, and 32 AD and moved to 33 AD. The difficulty that we, we face in all this is um, there's actually some very good arguments, I think, that can be made for 32 AD. It has a, a couple points that it does seem to be superior in. There's other points where 33 AD seems superior in. Um, I, what I like to tell people is I don't know that we can have absolute certainty on the Lord Jesus' birth date or his cross date, but we are very, very close. And it we're, we're close enough for all practical purposes. Yeah. I, I think it's one of the things that's involved here is um, if we knew for certain uh, the Lord's cross date, then that adds an element of certainty to our theories like the 6,000 year theory um, yeah. for figuring out where we are in the prophetic calendar. And I don't think the Lord wanted us to have that kind of certainty. I want, I think he wanted to put an extra layer of no man knows the day nor the hour on the subject. I do think in the, for me personally, I believe in a six day creation and I do believe that was a prophecy of 6,000 years. And yep. Um, I have all those reasons listed at the site as well, if you want to go look at it. And if you want to know more about these things, you can study stuff around the resurrection and just studying the feasts alone. I feel like I'll never be finished with that, but studying the feasts is teaches you so much about timing and it's an agricultural year. And there's prophecies all throughout that agricultural year. Christ fulfilled the first four feasts himself, and I expect none other than Christ to fulfill the remaining three. Yep. Well, here's an yeah. interesting question. I've been shopping for a comprehensive book of first century church fathers' writings, but can only find collections that are either much later or heavily Catholic. Can you recommend a book? Ken and, yep. Johnson and yourself. Yeah. Well, you what have I videos. Yes, what I would point out is there are no first century church father writings except the books in the New Testament, period. Um, uh, it, unless it's possible that uh, uh, possibly something in the apostolic fathers could have been written prior to uh, John's death, but typically the apostolic fathers writings were in the second century, which would be 100 AD to 200 AD. Uh, that stuff would have been written around 100 AD to 160, 170 AD. And here, he, um, and so some of the earlier stuff we have uh, Clement, Polycarp, and, and these gentlemen, which is going to be mostly it's going to be from like 100 to 130, 140 AD. And then right after them, we have Irenaeus, which is also in the second century. So what you would want to get is just look for the writings of that's called the Apostolic Fathers. You can find English translations online for free. Um, you can buy copies of the Apostolic Fathers in English very cheaply on Amazon. You can find Irenaeus's writings. Some people say Irenaeus um, very easily. You can find them for free. Just Google, Google his writings. You'll find um, his Against Heresies, five books, and you can read that for free. So, but those are going to be the primary second century church fathers, which would be the first century after the writing of the New Testament. That's something I want to get into a lot more lately too. And I have been seeing Ken Johnson putting out a ton of material on the uh, early fathers and, and you have as well. Uh, if you got the time for videos, but audio books, yeah, I don't know. I know Ken has been addressing that. He's been hitting that hard lately. Yeah, um, he's done a, an amazing amount of research in the early church fathers and the Essenes. Very, very helpful uh, research. My research in the early fathers has been primarily immediately dealing with um, 
with trying to read early church fathers, reading their Greek works that are not translated into English and working through them and finding rapture passages that were unknown. So like reading through the works of Ephraim and finding 10 unknown pre-tribulation rapture passages, reading through uh, works of Eusebius that are either hard to find or not translated, uh, reading them in the Greek and finding nine rapture passages there that were unknown. And now recently going carefully through Irenaeus and finding four rapture passages. One of them was already known and cited by a lot of people, but I think the other three I've never seen cited. So anyway, that's been a great blessing. That's where my research has gone. I look forward to watching those videos. I saw your pre-trib uh, where you're going through those and I'm like, ooh, I can't wait to watch them. And if anybody ever wants them, I have a list of all the people who uh, believed in a pre-trib from Ken also at the site. Um, so when people say, oh, it's invented by Darby and so on, like there's yep. a list. Huge. I, I, if you ever want to go reference that quickly in the prophecy section. Here's the last question that we have in this uh, email here. Before we are raptured, will the skies turn dark? And I would say no, not at the rapture. I think, I think the the rapture when it happens, we're really looking at uh, the the events. It's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. People are just going about normal life now. Normal life in America is not the same as normal life in Africa or the normal life in Russia. But Russians are going to be going about their normal life. Chinese are going to be going about their normal life, which their life's a lot rougher than ours. We'll be going about our normal life in America. You know, we're going to see creep. We're going to see the new world order creep. There's no no way around it. But it's not going to come over us so steeply that we're going to be in the tribulation. But in this time of relative normality, the church is going to vanish. And, and another element to that is that I'm in Australia. And if you, I'm in a gym right now, but if you look out the window, sun is still up over here. Yep. And that adds a whole other, and it's a different day altogether. Yep. So it, things can get very complicated and then it comes down to perspective. And then you start learning about, Greenwich time zone, the meridian, and you're like, well, I really don't think God is, when you, when you try going and looking up timing of things, it can get very tricky. And obviously you could say, well, it's probably from Israel, but this is the time of the church. So you can really kind of get, you can give yourself a headache trying to do that sort of thing. But I'm not discouraging like timing of stuff. These things are going to happen on a certain day for everyone. That's and right. Uh, it will happen. I don't, if you want to pinpoint exactly when it could get tricky, so be warned. <laughs> ask me how I know. Well, don't uh, ask me. Right. right. Well, we ran out of questions there. And uh, I do want to close with one more thought here. Let's just touch on a little bit, and it's a good place to close up. We talked about just mention the fact that one of the watermarks in the Bible is the actual ability of the scriptures to change people. Mm -hmm. Why don't you elaborate on that for a minute? I would be happy to, because I am a prime example of that. And that's a simple sentence that has so much meaning behind it that um, I think people who've been Christians their whole lives or been in a church their whole life, they are disconnected from it. But if you've been a lost sheep like me, who's been picked up by God, carried back to the herd, um, you have a much better appreciation um, because I ran in anger. And when you start looking at the principles of the Bible, it says these things are good, these things are bad. If you put these things to the tests or, or watch them, you'll see um, the wisdom in the Bible I always like to say uh, the thing about wisdom is you can't ignore it. Or, I mean, you can't forget it. Like, it's there. You're yeah. going to see it. You're going to go and do something stupid, and you're going to see the effects of it, um, whether you like it or not. If you go and do something good, if you go help someone, if you go uh, any of these good values, you're going to see the effects of that. And then once you start thinking philosophically that God allowed this realm 
to exist so that we can have a free will to make a choice between these two things, you start realizing the more we do these bad things, the more we start creating an environment where boundaries get blown out. Everybody's constantly challenging these boundaries, like this is what a man is, this is what a woman is. And then we start changing all of these things. Nothing is sacred anymore. Amen. And there's no more morals, according to society. But the law that is given to us shows you the effects of that. And it changes men. It changed me. I've often thought about how God worked to change my life. Um, uh, here I am. I'm a junior in high school. And uh, just before my junior started, my family just ups and moves from beautiful Montana out to North Dakota. And so I go through my junior year. We're coming into the uh, the summer and the early fall of my going into my senior year. And a buddy in Montana, where I used to live, starts sending me gospel literature talking about being born again. I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. But he was talking about Jesus in a way that's like, wait a minute. I never heard a preacher talk about Jesus this way. He's talking like Jesus is his best friend. And he's yeah. talking like he actually knows Jesus. Uh, Jesus isn't just something, you, you know, it rattles in one ear and out the other on Sunday mornings. Yep. And I was intrigued. So uh, my senior year in high school, I asked my parents, can I go spend Montana, a vac Christmas vacation in Montana with my buddy? And I figured my parents would say no, and that would be the end of it. Well, they said, yeah, you can do that. So then I went to work and I, I got permission I tried to get permission to take two weeks off for Christmas vacation. And I said, no, nope, can't have it off. So I quit my job, put a two weeks notice up. Come Christmas vacation, I'm on a Greyhound bus traveling from North Dakota to Montana. And I, I got out there. We were in the basement of the cathedral, the big Catholic cathedral in Helena, Montana. This had been Christmas vacation, 1978. And... Now, I can look back and I can tell you that was a Catholic charismatic meeting and they didn't have a whole lot of light. But I can tell you something else. They had more light than I had. They had enough light to preach the gospel to me. I heard the gospel. I believed it. And I got saved. And my life has never been the same since. But what's amazing about this is I, I look back and it's like I, I was I hadn't really been seeking the Lord. and yet. Here, here, salvation is salvation. It's it's pretty amazing that the yeah. the Lord worked in my life, and then once I was saved and, st and started walking with the Lord and reading the Bible, I could look back in my life and see like little milestones where the Lord was working in my life. Totally, yeah, totally. And that salvation thing, man. I just spent a. <sighs> I I went to a funeral yesterday where there was not one mention of Jesus, not one cross. And it was, it ripped my heart out. And these people, I can see, even just my presence there, I can see them. You're faced with the inescapable reality that we are going to leave at some point. That's right. We're not in charge. And um, these people think that God is mean. Pull it together, <laughs> but um, all I want to do is let them know. Amen. It couldn't be the opposite. Yeah, and, I've um, come to realize that faith is not only trusting in the person of Jesus Christ and his work. Yeah. Faith has got a deeper element. Faith is trusting that God is good. And that he has your best needs and in, uh, um, the, he's got your best interest at heart. He is what gives life value Amen. and meaning and purpose. And all you got to do is believe in him. He tells you what he tells you to protect you. And Amen. I just want I want to share that with everybody. And um, my site's your site. And if there's anything that driving your bonkers on it. I'm the only one who controls it. So feel free to send me an email and um, 
we go through it or I'll fix it or make it better or whatever. So. All right, brother. Well, we're coming to 10 o'clock. Um, do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share? So if you do just share a minute or two, some closing thoughts, and then why don't you close us with a word of prayer? All right. I just wanted to say thanks for having me on. Was a, I pretty much said it all other than that. And um, I appreciate the YouTube church out there. I see a lot of these people putting an effort. Tyler, um, Nikki from Rapture Watcher. She hasn't been on in a while. She's been going through a lot, but she is such a sweetheart. And um, there's a lot of people, a lot of groups, a lot of channels that are trying and they're just this church on YouTube is fantastic. And there's a lot of people seeking. I want people to go out and not just sharpen themselves, but go attempt seeing what works with others. And I'm Amen. telling you, after what I've been through, lead with love. Let them know that they are loved um, and on purpose. And as soon as you do that, it's incredible how much more effective you can be. <laughs> and, and that's what Jesus says to do. So funny about that. But um, thank you for having me. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for being out there. You are such an amazing resource. And uh, guys like Mondo, oh, my gosh, he's helped me so much too. <laughs> Prophecy Watchers is a great place to go for a lot of this. They do exactly that. They collect all these amazing people and interview them. And there's so many good resources out there, so use them. Um, we don't have much time left. We really are getting close to the end. Um, there's a lot of reasons to believe that. This is different. Go ask Tyler. He'll tell you. And <laughs> ask Lee. Um, anything else you'd like to add or shall I pray? No. Um, I think you wrapped her up pretty good, brother. Why don't you go ahead and close us with a word of prayer? Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for our lives. Um, it's so easy to complain when you're in the furnace or the hammer's hitting you, but everything that you're doing in this life is because you're developing us and we have no idea what it is we have on the other side. We have our life in front of us and it bothers us, but you have our eternity in mind and um, help us to trust you not just trust in you, but trust you, even with our trials, that what you're doing is achieving a thing that we will thank you for, no matter how hard it is. Thank you so much for creating us, creating this realm and being love and showing us so many ways that you're real and your word. I do not want to think of this world had you not given us your word. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank everyone for showing up tonight. Uh, Sean, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Um, moderators, thank you. thank you. Thank you. A thousand thank yous for the work that you do behind the scenes and, and making the room just go that much more smoothly. Uh, it's just a tremendous blessing to gather together in the Twitter church. Tremendous blessing to gather together on YouTube church. Tremendous blessing to gather together with believers on Facebook. I know that for some of you, social media ends up being a very large percentage of your fellowship. Maybe for some of you, it's almost all of it. Yeah. Um, I, I could wish and pray that we all had great opportunities for local Bible-believing churches. Some of you uh, have great churches. Some of you have mediocre churches. Some of you don't really have a church that you can call home. So I'm very, very thankful for all of you out there in social media land, particularly here in the, I think the YouTube family is the biggest. But um, God bless you all. Keep pressing on. Keep looking up. Keep walking in the spirit. Keep searching for truth. Uh, keep being Bereans, you know, uh, watching teaching videos and weighing and taking them back to the scriptures. See if what they say is true. That's your number one obligation, folks is to be a good Berean. Your number one obligation is a search for truth and then compare what you think is truth with the truth of the scriptures to refine it. At any rate, that's my closing word. We'll see you all later, folks, and I'm going to close the stream down. Love you, bro. Thank you. All right. Love you, too. <laughs>